Revelation 19. Beginning with verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From its mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he will strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the wine press of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds which fly in mid-heaven, Come and assemble for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of commanders and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and those who sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free men and slaves, small and great. And I saw the beast... And the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was seized with him, the false prophet, who performed the signs in his presence by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword, which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. And now, Lord, as we anticipate the return of the Son of the living God, would you awaken us to this reality because of the accuracy of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Any of you who have watched the movie The Terminator with Arnold Schwarzenegger knows that one of the iconic phrases that has come out of that series of films is the phrase, I'll be back. That despite the chaos and the turmoil that he faced, in spite of the fact of him being melted he promised a return, that he would come back. When Jesus Christ died and rose from the dead, he stood on the mountain of Olives just outside of Jerusalem, and he told his disciples, I'm coming back. He said, I'm coming back to the same place from which you've seen me ascend. Jesus prophesied his second coming. As we continue in our series on prophecy today, I want to, as best as I can, recognize the limitation of time that I have to summarize for you the greatest and most epic event that will occur in human history. And that event is designated the second coming of Jesus Christ. It will be the most spectacular, the most dynamic, it will be the most jaw-dropping thing that has ever occurred in history that was real. Sony Pictures can't compete with it. Sci-fi will be embarrassed by it. Because this will be real. Jesus made it clear that if I, if I rise from the dead, 
then everything else must, in fact, be true. Of course, if Jesus has not risen from the dead, we shouldn't even be here today. But if, if the resurrection is true, then everything else he has prophesied is equally true. The second coming of Jesus Christ will come at the conclusion of an event. To understand and appreciate the second coming of Christ, you have to understand the event that leads up to it. You've all heard about it. You've seen movies about this event. This event is not unknown. It is recognized. It's used in common everyday lingo. It's called the Battle of Armageddon. The Battle of Armageddon will be the World War III, to put it in language we can relate to, that will lead to the second coming of Christ. And so to introduce the second coming, I need to talk about World War III that was prophesied in the scripture. The Battle of Armageddon is not one battle. It is a series of battles or a campaign, if you will, that will culminate in the second coming of Christ. Let me lay it out for you, show you a couple of key scriptures so that you can grasp it because there's so much to it that as best as I can, I want to summarize it for you. The tribulation is the seven-year period of time after the rapture of the church where God will reestablish his program with Israel. Now, the reason he must reestablish his program with Israel is because God's revelation was to come through Israel. His written and living revelation was to come through his sovereign choice of the nation Israel. Because of Israel's rejection of Messiah, God has placed them aside for the time being to work with the church. The church will be raptured, as we have seen, introducing the 70th week of Daniel, or the last seven years of history as we now know it. There will be a peace treaty signed. We've already seen this by the Antichrist, and he will seem like the answer to the Middle East conflict. He will establish a peace treaty. This Antichrist will arise out of Europe, the ten toes of Daniel, overseeing the now already built European Confederacy, Confederation of, of Nations that now exist in Europe, where the Bible prophesied that there would be a common currency. It's now in place, the euro. And so the Antichrist will arise and he will be this peacemaker in the first half of the tribulation. Satan understands that to block the second coming of Christ, he's got to get rid of Israel. Because Israel is the one thing standing in the way of him nullifying the promises of God. Because God promised it would come through Israel. Israel has rejected him. Therefore, he must get rid of Israel so that they, they do not respond to him. And so when you get to this part of prophecy, Israel is on center stage. And the Middle East is on the front page. So let's bring it now to the middle of the tribulation. Those of you on Wednesday night have seen over and over again the, men the mention of three and a half years or 42 months over and over and over again. That's called in the Bible the Great Tribulation, the last half of the seven-year period. During this period of time, the last three and a half years, something is going to occur. That something is summarized for us in Daniel chapter 11, verses 40 to 45. And I will summarize for you that for you now. Because this will occur as we come to the middle of the tribulation, which will set in motion Armageddon. 
the prophet Daniel prophesying about the Antichrist who is to come, says in chapter 11, at the end of time, the king of the south will collide with him, the Antichrist, and the king of the north will storm against him with chariots, with horsemen, and with many ships. And he will enter countries, overflowing, overflow them, and pass through. He will also enter the beautiful land, Israel, and many countries will fall, but these will be rescued out of his hand. Verse 42, then he will stretch out his hand against other countries, and the land of Egypt will not escape. But he will gain control over the hidden treasure and gold and silver and over the precious things of Egypt. Verse 44, but rumors from the east and from the north will disturb him, and he will go forth with great wrath to destroy and annihilate many. Daniel now prophesying about the end time, at the end of time, says that there will be a reaction to the rise of the Antichrist. The Antichrist is going to rise as this worldwide peacemaker, and he will say like Hitler, today Europe, tomorrow the world. And he will lay claim to world rulership. The king of the north, Russia, and the communist bloc is going to react to that not wanting the Antichrist to rule and will attack the Antichrist. So you should not be surprised today when you open up the newspaper and see that Russia has now come to the aid of Syria joining Iran against Israel. He says there will now also be a reaction from the king of the south. That's Egypt and the Islamic contingency which is also against Israel. So Egypt, the Arab nations, and the religion of Islam is going to come against Israel and the Antichrist who has positioned himself initially as a friend of Israel. So you've got these two groups coming against the Antichrist. The Antichrist is going to defeat them causing another army to come into the play. You read it, it's the army from the east. That's China. That's the eastern bloc, which seeing the power of the Antichrist and not wanting to be overruled, will move, the book of, Revel the book of Revelation says, with an army of 200 million strong to come up against the Antichrist who has set himself up to rule the whole world. So you got all of this stuff happening, and it's all happening in one location, the Middle East. Look at Revelation chapter 16. Here's what we read, verse 13. And I saw out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, that is the unholy trinity, three unclean spirits like frogs. And they were spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the war of the great day of God, the Almighty. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his clothes so that he will not walk about naked and men will not see his shame. And they gather them together to the place which in Hebrew is called Har-Megedon, or the valley or the mountain of Armageddon. Armageddon is a huge plain. Napoleon Bonaparte, when he saw the valley, uh, the, uh, the valley of Megiddo, he said, this is the most natural battlefield in the world. It is huge. And it will be the staging area or central control for this battle where these armies are coming initially against the Antichrist. So that is a summary of what will set in motion this battle of Armageddon. Now, when all of this is taking place, God is not silent. Zechariah chapter 14 puts it this way. 
in describing the same battle through another prophet, and that's some of the challenge of this because it's scattered throughout the Bible, but verse 2 says, For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the city will be captured, the houses plundered, the women ravaged, and half of the city exiled, but the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. The Lord will go forth and fight against those nations, and when he fights on the day of battle. So, let me explain this, Lucy. All these nations are coming together in the Middle East, because Satan has got to get rid of Israel. That's, that's his last hope for victory against God. But Zechariah says, God is bringing the nations together. But Revelation 16 says that the unholy trinity is bringing the nations together. So who's bringing the nations together? Both. Satan is doing it for his purposes, and God is doing it for his purposes. So you have to understand something about God, and that is God can use the devil to accomplish his purposes. Okay? There are many illustrations of that in the Bible, but for our sake today, God is allowing the devil to be the devil in order to accomplish the will of God. So whenever you think of the devil, just remember he's God's devil. Okay? And so God is using the rebellion of Satan to accomplish his purposes. So now, the whole world is centered on the Middle East. When this happens, CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, all of them are going to be talking about this. Some of you may ask, well, where is the United States in all of this? Well, remember, the Antichrist is over Europe. The military of Europe is NATO. The United States is the power and economic support for NATO. So when the Antichrist rises in Europe, the United States is swallowed in that because the United States supports the European Union. So we become, in fact, the United States was born out of Europe. So it's natural it would be the support for this European activity that takes place. So now you have the whole world centered in Israel. You have now the leaders of the nation of the world coming together initially against the Antichrist who begins to defeat some of them. And as we saw last time, in the midst of all of this, the Antichrist in the middle of the tribulation is going to break his agreement with Israel. It's called the abomination of desolation. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, he's going to come in and he's going to now try to destroy Israel. At the beginning of the tribulation, he was Israel's friend. Now, he becomes Israel's enemy. That's why in Revelation chapter 12, we read in, in uh, verse 13, and when I saw the dragon, he saw that he was thrown down to earth. He persecuted the woman, Israel, who gave birth to the male child, Jesus, and God has to protect Israel from the Antichrist decision to destroy them. So he provides this protection for Israel. We see in verse 15, and the serpent poured out water like a river out of his mouth after the woman, Israel, so that he might cause her to be swept away with the flood. He's trying to drown or destroy Israel. Because if he does not destroy Israel, he cannot keep Christ from coming back. And if Christ comes back, he's doomed. Now, this sermon is on the second coming of Christ. But you have to understand that we're setting the stage. And the stage is being set by all the world now coming together in the Middle East for the destruction of Israel. And the reason that they are doing that is because Satan has to stop the return of Christ by destroying Israel. Now with that backdrop,
you ever been in a play? You're in, you're in a play and the screen is closed. And you know, you're talking because the play is not ready to start yet. And then the lights begin to dim. It begins to get a little darker and a little darker and a little darker. You know what that means? It means it's showtime. Turn to Matthew chapter 24. Let me show you showtime. Not at the Apollo, <laughs> but on planet Earth. Verse 29. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. And the moon will not give its light. And the stars will fall from the sky. And the powers of the heaven will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. Okay, so if you're here, which means you weren't saved, because if you were saved, you wouldn't be here because you'd have been part of the rapture. So for all y'all that's going to be here, <laughs> let me describe what's going to happen. As these battles are being fought, first between the Antichrist and those who are coming against him, and then the Antichrist going against Israel, as all of this World War III stuff is occurring and news is being fed about it all around the world through, through media and through all of the technology that, that now we understand why God waited for the return of Christ because he wanted technology set in place so that what he prophesied could take place that people before the technology did not know was part of God's plan but all of this is part of God's sovereign plan and so what is going to happen is God is going to block the light of the sun. The darkness will begin to, to uh, uh, descend upon the earth because it's showtime. The Bible declares, and every eye will see him. When Jesus Christ makes his return, in some way, whether he loops around the sun so that in a in a 24-hour period, the whole world will see him because of the rotation of the earth on its axis or whether technology has become so sophisticated by then that it is seen by everybody, whether on a, on a telephone or whether on an iPad or whether on a computer or whether on television, some kind of way, God is going to give worldwide manifestation that the Son of God has arrived and that it's now showtime. Now, you can dismiss this to sci-fi if you want to. But the declaration is clear that on this occasion, and in the words of the fight announcer, Jesus is coming and saying, let's get ready to rumble. He will make his descent from heaven into history. He will make his presence seen. And so the scripture says in Revelation 1, 7 and here in Matthew 24, 31, that the whole world will see this. As Jesus Christ manifests himself and as the scripture that we read in Revelation chapter 19 he is going to descend, it says, on a white horse. Now, to appreciate this, you have to understand that that, he didn't, that wasn't just something made up. When a Roman general went out to defeat a nation in biblical times, he would always ride a white horse. The reason he rode a white horse is that was the horse of victory. So whenever you see a Roman general coming back from a victory, he's on a white horse to symbol the battle is over, the battle has been won, victory has been held. 
So when it says Jesus is coming back on a white horse, it says he's coming back victorious. He's coming to victory. Why? Because he has now gotten the whole world on, on the same page. It says he's going to call all of Israel back to Jerusalem. And in the midst of that, he will descend from heaven with eyes, verse, chapter 19, verse 12 says, a flame of fire. Now, let me explain this. This is not Jesus meek and mild. This is not sweet little Jesus boy. No. You have two ways you can relate to Jesus. You can relate to him on the cross where he's the Savior. Or you can relate to him on the throne where he's the judge. Every parent, or most parents, have two sides to them. The gucci gucci goo side, and I'm aware you outside. All right? We've already seen on Wednesday night, we've seen they refuse to repent. They refuse to repent. They even curse God in the book of Revelation. So at that point, Jesus is now coming back as judge to judge the world and their rejection of him as the son of the living God. And when he comes, his robe is dipped in blood, verse 13 says. His name is called the word of God. And the armies that are with him. Now that's where you and I come in. That's where you and I come in. You get a white horse. Okay? The armies that are with him, remember, we go with him in the rapture. We then go through the judgment seat of Christ where we are given rewards. We then get ready for the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's next week. That's a, that's a big event. And we come with him. At the rapture, we go to him. At the second coming, we come back with him. Okay? The rapture, we're caught up. The second coming, he comes down. He does not come down to earth at the rapture. He comes down to earth at the second coming. At the second coming, the armies that are with him, those who are dressed in with, with, with the, uh, uh, the linen of, uh, of our redemption, come with him, verse 13, 14 says, on white horses. And in his mouth is a sharp sword that he might strike down the nations. So here's what's going to happen. The world has converged on the Antichrist. The Antichrist has had victory over many of those nations. The East comes because of what they've seen him do with the King of the North and the King of the South. In the middle of all this Armageddon confusion, Jesus Christ leaves heaven with the saints. He comes down and he makes his presence seen by the whole world. And according to Zechariah chapter 14, Verses 3 and 4, he lands on the Mount Olive, which is where he left, which is what the Bible says. He's coming back to the same place he left. It says when his feet hit the ground, the earth will split. It says there will be an earthquake when Jesus' feet hit the ground that will go all the way down to the Dead Sea. When his feet hit the ground on the Mount of Olives, Zechariah 14 says, he will speak with his mouth. One of the things he will say, do you, you remember Alfred Hitchcock, the birds? It says he will summon all the birds to come and get ready for supper because it's meal time. And through a spoken word out of his mouth, the Bible says he will speak the word and he will slay the nations. So this is not going to be a long battle. This, this, this part is real short. Those other things will last a number of years in the second half of the tribulation. But on this one, Jesus Christ will speak the word and he will summon in the most dramatic act of warfare in human history. He will bring about the slaughter of those who reject him. The Bible says when Jesus Christ does this, Zechariah 12.10 says, Israel will look 
at him on whom they pierced. And they will repent and receive Jesus as Messiah or as Romans chapter 11 verse 26 says, and then all of Israel shall be saved. They will receive Jesus Christ as their Messiah. And when they receive him as their Messiah, the Old Testament promises will be fulfilled because Israel has to accept him before they can be fulfilled. God allows these events to occur to drive Israel to accepting him. And then the Bible says Jesus Christ will set up his millennial kingdom, which is our discussion next week. The beast, verse 20, was seized. And with him the false prophet who performed the signs in the presence of him who deceived the folks with the mark of the beast. And they were thrown alive into the lake of fire which burns with brimstone. So Jesus will defeat men. He will get the antichrist. He will get the false prophet. They're cast into the lake of fire. And as you will see next week, he's got a special program for the devil. And you and I are with him. All those who've come to Jesus Christ for salvation are with him. So what do we do with all of this? What, what, do, we, what do we do with all this? There's so much. When Jesus comes back, he will come back as king of kings and lord of lords, it says. Today we got kings for everything. You got lion king. You got the king of soul, the king of pop, the king of swing, the king of the beast. You got king of rock and roll. But when Jesus comes back, it says with many diadems, that's a whole bunch of crowns. He's king of kings and lord of lords. And he will rule with a rod of iron. You will see a perfect dictatorship. The, the world will be under a dictator, but a righteous dictator, which is why he's called faithful and true. And Jesus Christ will set up his millennial kingdom. We'll go into details on that next week. And he will rule the world from Jerusalem. The whole world. And based on the rewards that you get, based on your life now, will determine how you will be positioned then. If you were a faithful follower of Jesus Christ, you will be highly positioned. If you were an unfaithful follower of Jesus Christ, you'll be a street sweeper. Now, you'll be singing while you sweep. You know, because, you know, you, you're saved, so, so you're going to be a happy street sweeper. But you will be assigned a role based on your faithfulness now and your commitment to Jesus Christ now and your public confession of him now. That will determine the, the role you have. So that's why even though this, this Armageddon stuff does not directly apply to you, it directly applies to you. Because what you do now affects your role then, when Jesus Christ returns. It also, as I mentioned a moment ago, ought to give you a different perspective on the devil. Because what you need to understand, as evil as he, as he is, he is limited now. He can't do to you all he wants to do to you because of what 2 Thessalonians calls the restrainer, holds him back. The Holy Spirit limits what he can do. That's why the scripture says, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world, because Satan right now is on a leash. When you have a dog on a leash, it can go somewhere, but only as far as the leash allows. In the tribulation, when the leash is extended, he will be able to do more. But right now, what he can do to you is lie. Trick you. Trick you in your thinking, trick you in your emotions. He can trick you 
to make you think he's bigger and badder than he really is, but he's so good at it. Have you ever met anybody that's a born liar? That means that mean they're real good at it because they've been doing it since they were a child. He's a born liar, and because he's the father of lies, the scripture says, he can make you believe you don't have victory, you can't have victory, you won't have victory, you are defeated, you, you know. He can do all that. He can really do it then, but he can do it now. But what God wants you to understand is that the devil at his best is his devil. And while the devil is trying to mess over you, God is doing something else. He's constructing something else. Paul said it this way. He said, we look through a glass darkly. We don't, we don't see things clearly. You, I got a watch, you have a watch, and I, I look at the face of my watch, so I can tell you the time, because I look at my face, but, but if you'd have asked me, give me the details of how all the parts work, I can't, I can't explain that. All I know is, it's 920. I, I can tell you that much, but there are a whole lot of details in here that I can't explain, those little teeny parts and how they, they relate to one another. I can't explain all that. I can just tell you what time it is. And there's a whole lot, there's a whole lot of details. I've only touched the surface. All I can do is give you a summary. There's so many details in this thing through all the different prophets and all the different predictions. And all, the, I, all I've done, all I've done is shown you the time. Okay? Because that's, that's all I can do. Even after you study the book of Daniel, you study the book of Revelation, all I've done is shown you the time God has the parts and the details and how they all intersect and relate to one another and, and how, they all, how they all connect. But you know something? You really don't need to know how it all works. You need to know what time it is. So what I'm trying to tell you is what time it is. Yeah, all the details and, and all of the, in this country and Syria and Lebanon and Persia and all that, all of those are discussed. They're discussed in Ezekiel chapter 38, Ezekiel chapter 29, uh, 38 and 39, Gog and Magog, and, and, and it talks about Iran and that. And it's, all, that's, all that's in there. And, and, and I, 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 I get a headache. I get, I, I get depressed sitting down to prepare this stuff for y'all. I'm sitting in my study looking at all this stuff and reading all this stuff, and I'm, I'm saying, let me, let me call Pastor Gibson and tell him preach, because it's just, it's just too much stuff. But what I can tell you is what time it is. And uh, just in case you didn't know, it's getting late. Uh, that, that much I can tell you. So I know next week we're going to fall back, but eschatologically speaking, you better jump forward because it's, it's getting late. Who would have thought, who would have thought that after Russia broke down and broke up and disintegrated that, that, that it would be part of the prophetic scene overnight? reasserting itself as we back up and they move forward and the bear, Russia, now begins to ascend to take charge in the Middle East. Who would have thought that Iran would now emerge as a dominant influence over there? Who would have thought that overnight ISIS would arise in the midst of that? Who would have thought all of this would occur? The reason why you must take prophecy serious is God has already seen the future and come back to notify us about it. And it says Israel will look on him on whom they pierced. They said crucify him, crucify him. You and I will be with him. Everyone who's come to faith in Christ will be with him. You will never mistake him. 
He will stand out in the crowd. Because Jesus Christ will be the only scarred person. You will have a perfectly new glorified body. You will be the same race that you are. You will be the same gender that you are. You will, you will simply be perfect humanity. At your most perfect age, which I take to be 33. <laughs> now, I didn't make that up. I got that from the, 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 the life age of Jesus Christ. Adam, remember, and Eve were created as adults. They weren't created as kids. So you will be your perfect self. There will be a scarred one. For they will look on him who they pierced. When Jesus arose from the dead, Thomas said, unless I see the nail prints in his hand and the scar in his side, I will not believe. Jesus came to Thomas after he rose from the dead and said, see these nails? See this scar? Thomas touched them. So you'll never confuse who your savior is because from the time you meet him at the rapture all the way through the millennium into eternity, those will be the eternal reminders that you're saved by these scars, you're delivered by this scar, you're delivered by these scars, the nail prints in his hand, the scar in his side, the nail prints in his feet, so that when I meet you at the corner of Gold Street and Silver Boulevard, we will be giving praise to the Savior who loved us, gave his life for us, saved us, raptured us, redeemed us, returned with us, and given us eternal life with him. And that makes him worthy of praise. Let's stand to our feet. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, no one moving, we're going to close in a moment. But if you need to come to the Savior, I don't mean come to church, I don't mean be religious, I'm talking about something else. I'm talking about giving your life to Jesus Christ, who is the center of God's story. And you want to meet him as Savior, not as judge. Would you slip out of your seat and come down and let me pray with you as you make this decision? to either come to Christ or get right with Christ. Anybody need to make that decision?